Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start by thanking Ishan and Shankar for inviting me to give a talk and also for running this conference. I think we've all uh, enjoyed it enormously and they've ran really a very good uh, meeting. I'd like to secondly actually leave uh, this and uh, show you something else. Back to PowerPoint. So this is some work I'm going to uh, tell you about, which was uh, mainly done by a very interesting postdoc uh, from China, Zong Zheng, um, who I've known since we met in Princeton some time ago, and he and I have written a number of papers uh, together. You, of course, know of uh, Natalie and her wonderful understanding of uh, granular media. Uh, John Neufeld, uh, sorry, um, Jerome Neufeld uh, supported uh, Zhang while we were writing up uh, the paper and uh, Paul Linden had got a David Crichton fellowship for Zhang when we uh, started this work. Um, I'm going to tell you about the flow of buoyant granular material along a free surface and that's really an example of a gravity current, uh, a current, a fluid motion that moves mainly horizontally due to the vertical component of gravity and the differences in density. Just to give you an indication, I'd like to show you some examples. Uh, this is a compositional gravity current. In other words, it's a gravity current that's driven by the difference in composition between the current, which is salt, and fresh water here. So this is salty water which this being India has milk added to it uh, so that you can see it. So this is a milky uh, salt driven gravity current. This is a scale in millimeters and this is one of the very first pictures that were taken of this phenomenon by uh, John Simpson. This is exactly the same only in a larger uh, scale in the field. This is over Los Angeles where the sun comes up each morning uh, warms the uh, land in preference to the ocean out here and uh, that makes the air over the land less dense than over the oceans. It rises and that leads to the water, the air rather, sorry, over the ocean coming forward in the form of a uh, gravity current. This is now a particle laden uh, gravity current due in Scotland to the demolition of these uh, houses and uh, a current of heavy, uh, generally heavy fluid made heavy by the particles comes out into the atmosphere. This is of course a very famous photograph I could show of the same thing but I never do that. I don't like it. Uh, this is now a hot particle driven uh, flow. Uh, this is as a result of uh, a volcanic eruption in uh, Unzen in uh, Japan. It's uh, probably something like seven, eight hundred degrees uh, temperature uh, with uh, lots of uh, hot ash uh, particles that are going at about 700 uh, kilometers an hour maybe. Oh, no, 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 that's a bit much. Uh, 500 kilometers an hour. And this is a hotel, sorry. This was a hotel uh, and uh, it uh, is no longer, as you can imagine. This is now a snow uh, particle driven uh, current uh, down the slope due to uh, an avalanche. There are no doubt lots of different sizes, as we heard uh, already uh, this morning. Large snow particles, small snow particles and intermediate snow particles. Now this is a very interesting and important gravity current due to the eruption of uh, Mount St. Helens. It was a hot ash laden flow that moved along here, but the heavy ash particles fell to the ground. They fall to the ground as they go along and we come to a point right here where the temperature difference plays a larger role 
than the partic particulate difference. And so instead of being hot and heavy, it becomes hot and light because it shed enough of the ash particle so that it can rise, and that's called a coignimbrite uh, cloud, that's the um, nomenclature. So there was a man standing here taking a photograph who was saved, but there were lots of people here, I'm afraid, who died. This is uh, now coming closer to uh, what we're going to talk about. This is a pyroclastic flow in, uh, from Montserrat in 1995. Pyroclastic flow is the geological term for a hot, ash-laden uh, particular gravity current. And here it's coming over the sea here. And it propagates over the sea for quite some time. There are no doubt uh, lots of different sizes of ash here and it's more or less like a porous medium. Uh, a little bit like this, if I cut it into lots of, lots of little uh, pieces, it's a porous uh, medium that's been uh, erupted from uh, the volcano. The air under pressure has uh, forced some of the rock apart and you get lots of little particles which can be, because they take in air in the pores, uh, lighter than water. And it's an interesting question, which another graduate student of mine worked on, how long it'll take before they uh, sink. Here's now uh, an example uh, also of some uh, light particles coming down onto uh, the surface. They're different uh, sizes, as you can uh, already see, and they're going to propagate uh, along the surface, and it's of interest to know how, and how long that takes. Now, here is the beginning of a uh, compositional gravity current movie, and rather than show you a video, I thought it would be more interesting to do some real experiments. So what I'm going to uh, do here uh, is start by making some heavy fluid in a compositional uh, way. Please come up. There's, it's like, it's, there's a whole 10 empty rows up here. So why don't you come on up so you can see the experiment. Can I very much thank uh, the chairman for uh, suggesting that. I was with a little bit of nervousness going to do it myself, but I can add, which he couldn't, unfortunately, I promise not to bite you. You're quite safe. You don't have to uh, worry. Please come on up. Take a minute. Okay. And I get this extra minute from my time, yes? Yes, of course. <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's, it's you or lunch, so, you know. <laughs> It could be me for lunch, which would be a more of a problem. <laughs> well, what we're going to do is make a compositional current uh, first, and I'm going to make it uh, with uh, superfine uh, sugar, uh, which I stole enough of. Shh, don't say that. I, I borrowed. Uh, I'm going to give it back uh, from where I'm uh, staying. Um, I normally do this a little more quantitatively. Oh, thank you. Uh, a little more quantitatively, but uh, we're not going to take any measurements today, I hope. If we are, we're in trouble. Um, two more, and that'll do. And now, of course, I need a stirrer. What am I going to do? Um, well, I'm going to add just a little bit of dye so that we can see the motion. Really? You don't mind my using that? So we have here a volume of fluid with density rho, and rho is greater than 1, or 0.998, which is the density here. Let's go. And here you see the gravity current. This is high Reynolds number. It's definitely uh, turbulent, and it's moving along. 
and I want you to look sufficiently carefully that you can tell me how rapidly it moves. Exponentially, logarithmically, algebraically. Sorry? Power law. Power law, okay. And what's the power law? No, I'll ask somebody else. What's the power law? <laughs> and if only this tank didn't have an end, it would go on and on and on and on until viscosity played a role. How did you know it was a power law? <laughs> well done. <laughs> Can we turn the lights off for a second? Thank you very much. The power law, T to the two thirds. Very well uh, done. The initial area that I had for that uh, current, the G prime, in other words, the G times the delta rho over uh, rho itself, uh, uh, and it goes like t to the two-thirds, and this was uh, done with uh, John Simpson and me uh, quite some time ago. Okay, well, let's look at the next uh, example. Whoops, I thought that was the next example. Okay, we're going to do some particles. Don't have a look at this formula under any circumstances. <laughs> Don't cheat. <laughs> right, I'm going to mix up the uh, fluid. Thank you very much for this pen. Oh, he's gone. Oh, yes, and no, he's still there. It's never been used for better purposes. <laughs> Sorry? I wanted to write in red anyway. Oh, I, I was thinking, no, I still need it. Oh, you still do? Yes, please. Right. <laughs> or does somebody else want to lend me a pen? This man seems to be... <laughs> Now I'm going to add some heavy part. Well, I better add the gate first, you're dead right. Uh, but uh, we'll have a smaller gate, please. A little lock length, yeah. And I'm going to add some heavy particles. You see, they all sink to the bottom. But what I'm going to do is use this wonderful pen, thank you very much, to mix them up as best I can and you're going to let the gate go now. And they spread out, as you see. <laughs> Let's try a bigger concentration. Yeah, let's hold them like this, yeah? Never with animals, children, or experiment. Let's go. Well, You've got to use your imagination. <laughs> These particles, can I have the lights off again? These uh, particles will move uh, down again in a high Reynolds number uh, situation. Um, they'll fall to the ground in this turbulent gravity current uh, so that their concentration changes with time proportional to the Stokes free fall velocity, because they're small particles, the particle motion is uh, um, low Reynolds number, the fluid motion is high Reynolds number, times the concentration itself divided by the height uh, of the layer. And that, of course, is going to change with both the position and time. And you find that it goes out until the mass of particles you have in here, the G prime, just as before, the total mass behind here, over, whoops, come on. No, I wanted to go back. Why won't it go back? Well, now you've seen the whole talk. Um, where were we? Uh, times the total mass there. Uh, so the Stokes fall velocity all to the one-fifth times the area here, the initial area plays a role to the uh, three-fifths. Uh, and uh, that uh, can be, the, well, the equations can be written down and uh, solved. This is the, in some sense, the most important part of it. And here's some 
comparisons between two different uh, experiments, uh, which I carried out in Monash with uh, Joe Monaghan, uh, and here's the numerical integration of the resulting nonlinear differential equation, and here are the experiments, and here again, the experiments, and uh, there's really good agreement uh, there. Now, can I get the next? Um, now, what we're going to do in this uh, talk is uh, consider the case where you have light particles and they're going to go across uh, the uh, lock here. In the experiments that I'm going to tell you about, the length of the tank is 2 meters, it's 15 centimeters across, and we used water of depth either 15 centimeters or 20 centimeters. Um, they were light. Uh, polypropylene uh, balls. I know exactly um, how they work. What we're going to see is how the current ones uh, work. Um, I'll tell you what will we'll, we'll really shock you and we'll start it from the other end. You have to reverse the sign of X. And these are meant, I've never tried this before, these are meant to be light particles. Yeah, look at that. That part at least works well. Let's go. Well, you see, they uh, spread out. How far did they spread? Uh, no. <laughs> well, if any of you know the answer, that's ruined my whole seminar, I'm afraid, because I'm going to spend the rest of my seminar telling you about uh, this. That's the end of the experiments, but I wonder if you'd join me in thanking Prasad, where is he, for having <laughs> set this up. Very kind of you. Now, have I lost the pointer? Yeah. Okay, can we turn the lights off again? So this is uh, the situation, and this is the paper that came out just a few uh, months uh, ago. Uh, here's what it looks like initially, and then what it'll look like finally, as you saw uh, here. Um, whoops. And this is now snapshots of one particular experiment with the scale here. Oh, come on. Yeah, you're quite right. Damn difficult to use this. Here we go. Um, this is the snapshot of one particular experiment. This is 10 centimeter scale. So you can see this is a, no doubt a 20 centimeter depth. We've put in some particles here. They're light, so they don't go to the bottom because we haven't put enough uh, particles. They're light, they're relatively light, so they float on top a little bit uh, above uh, the water. Uh, that's how they are at zero, then we go, and you see initially there's not much motion here. There's motion in the front, but with time, the bottom, if you like, comes up, and we'll talk about how that happens, and we get something like this that stops. Now let me say that we can evaluate the Reynolds number all the way down until it stops, and the Reynolds number is large. Not huge, but thousands. Definitely large, so this viscosity doesn't play a role. What I should have said is when we're talking about compositional gravity currents, they're controlled by what goes on at the head. The famous von Kármán and uh, Brook Benjamin uh, work, the Froude number at the head, the ratio of the velocity to the square root of g prime h is root 2. In this case, the Froude number varies, and it's never anywhere near root 2. It varies from about 0.6 to 0.3. It's got nothing to do with it. This is not an inertial Bernoulli-driven uh, gravity current. It's quite different because there are particles. Oh, I'm going to use this. Um, this is now a top uh, view, and uh, you see here it is at uh, the initiation. It goes on and goes on and goes on, and after 10 seconds, it's pretty much come to the end. You don't see this as clearly as uh, I would like, but you see here, it's pretty two-dimensional. There's not much influence of the side walls, and as much as I'd like to, oh, she's, oh, as much as I'd like to have fingers here, I'm afraid I can't do them. They're never fingers. They're, 
that's not uh, what happens. It's very two-dimensional. So, how does it uh, go? Here's the uh, a typical uh, uh, graph of the X position down the uh, channel of the front in meters as a function of time in seconds. We started in this particular case with Xi, the initial value at the lock, if you like, of about uh, seven centimeters, and it gets longer and longer and longer, and then quite rapidly it uh, changes and uh, stops. Now, if we draw it on log log uh, scales, then this looks pretty much like a straight line. In other words, the front should go like alpha t to the beta in this bit, not over here, of course, but in this bit it should go like alpha t to the beta. So a power law was absolutely correct. But now I want you to tell me what the power law depends on. And you can think about it while I continue. So we're going to ask, uh, what does uh, the power law look like? This is now a series of experiments with different initial lock lengths, but with the same mass. So you're just spreading it out from 7 to 26 centimeters. Because it's the same mass, it means the depth at the bottom uh, is, uh, in this case, uh, decreasing in this way. And what you uh, see is that there's a variation Seems not much of a variation here, but definitely in a variation of where it ends. In other words, the final distance is dependent on the initial uh, size of uh, the uh, lock. With a smaller, deeper set of particles going further at the end than uh, the uh, opposite. Now we do this also in uh, um, log-log uh, plot. And we're asking, is there going to be some power law like that? It looks like there could be a power law, just as I showed you in the other diagram. But of course, we're going to have to work out how alpha depends on the initial conditions and how beta depends on the initial uh, conditions. So here's a, a plot of some of uh, the experiments, either carried out in salt water, where the flow is more buoyant, or the particles are more buoyant, or in fresh water, uh, in which they're less uh, buoyant, we've changed the uh, mass of uh, the particles. And here's beta, oh damn, as a function of xi. I moved this formula in the last minute, and I didn't notice that it had crossed over this. This is in actual scale, beta as a function of this. Well, there's quite a bit of difference, and we don't want that. What we want to do is to see if we can scale it properly. Well, we have beta and we have a length here, so one looks for a length. The only length in the problem is given by either of these expressions, either the initial depth of the particle layer times the initial x uh, length to the half, to make it because that's uh, length squared, so you take it to length. And that's exactly the same as the mass of particles divided by the width of the tank because it's only two dimensions, divided by its density, so you get the volume, but you know that there's a porosity, so you uh, take that into account, and you find that same length scale. So what that uh, means is that when I draw the next uh, slide where you see by, oh, come on. Is that here? Um, you see uh, that uh, here's xi, so that's x divided by lc, so this is a non-dimensional uh, x, and here's beta, the same beta as before, here are the same experiments. We can put it through a line. The best fit is whatever this is, and I don't care less, because I bet that the theory will say three-fifths xi to the minus four-fifths. And that, I'm sure, is what will uh, happen. Now, what about the prefactor, the uh, alpha? And you see here that if we plot, again, the same experiments, alpha as the initial lock length, we get a bit of a, a mess. Um, we have a length 
uh, to non-dimensionalize by. That means we can also get a non-dimensional representation of alpha because we've got a length, we've got g prime, and we uh, know what the units are, so we get this. So that tells us how to non-dimensionalize both alpha and xi. And here we uh, see we've non-dimensionalized this to make it a capital A by uh, this alpha C, and this little xi comes up to a, an xi, and the data falls together quite uh, um, well. And I bet this is 3 fifths x e to the half x when we do the theory. So this uh, shows you lots of uh, experiments uh, with different masses and different uh, widths and a little lump. Uh, and you see what happens initially is, of course, uh, different. What happens in this central region is really very well described by this relationship or non-dimensionalized uh, here. And then what later happens when it uh, slows down, this last bit is really quite uh, different. Now we'll actually look at what this uh, run out, final run out, the x of infinity is. Now here again, experiments, x of infinity is a function of xi, both of them in meters. And you see this is pretty much a scatter graph. Well, we'd expect that, but we're going to non-dimensionalize everything here and see what we can find. And we find that all the data collapses uh, together uh, and that the non-dimensionalized run out length as a function of the non-dimensionalized initial length behind uh, the lock goes pretty much like 8 uh, xi to the minus 1. That's the best fit of the data. Uh, and uh, 8 over xi is uh, not a bad uh, approximation. Now, what about the thickness of the beads here? I showed you at the beginning that it stayed uh, rather constant in some of them for a while and then seemed to uh, spread. And here's a, an example. Here's the initial thickness. Hi is the initial value of H0. This is now H0. In other words, this uh, thickness here as a function of time in seconds and on straight graph. And you see that it decreases, decreases, and then comes to an end after, or sorry, well before the uh, run-out length. The run-out length here is about 15 seconds, sorry, the run-out time when it stops is about 15 seconds, but this stops changing really quite uh, before that. Here's now a number of different uh, examples. I don't know why this is out of uh, focus. Uh, this is a number of uh, different uh, examples uh, with uh, different uh, values of the initial height of uh, the particles. It's the same mass, but a different length of uh, lock, and uh, hence this is thicker, thinner, thinner still. So this is the graph that I showed you uh, before, uh, and you have here the thickness of the top here above the uh, interface that goes down because the particles are taken away. There's the uh, bottom, uh, which pretty that these are the same, but the bottom is the lower one of these two, obviously, and the top one is the total height from the top particle to the smaller particle. Uh, now here, with the different initial uh, height, you see there's not much change. Same mass, but this is uh, after same time, 0.6 seconds, uh, there's not much uh, change. Okay, so this is the height at uh, the end of the thickness, the thickness at uh, the end in a linear scale in meters against the initial uh, uh, thickness. And we see something rather different than before. We see part of the data can be right here without any uh, non-dimensionalization, fit by a, a straight line, and then part of it looks rather different. But we think, well, we'd better non-dimensionalize uh, this. And so we do non-dimensionalize it by this length that I've mentioned uh, before. And what we find is that for relatively small non-dimensional thicknesses at first, so that means a relatively large lock length, the H infinity is exactly the same as the HI. 
This is a straight line, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. Uh, this is uh, uh, on uh, linear scales. A straight line, in other words, it's frozen. It doesn't move. The current moves forward, the beads are moved uh, forward, um, but uh, the uh, bottom doesn't uh, move forward. It does so just by extending it. Now, once you get the initial non-dimensional thickness larger than about uh, 0.6, uh, then it uh, goes, uh, the final thickness varies with the initial thickness, gets smaller as the uh, uh, initial thickness gets uh, larger and uh, larger in more or less a uh, straight line. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to change topics for just a, a moment. And since it's the last talk, I hope I can be uh, allowed to change from even granular media. And I want to tell you something about psychology. So it's just one little story about psychology, which is that there was a female Russian psychologist in the early 1900s who was well known for her psychology, also very well off. And so she employed people to uh, sweep the house, clean the house, drive her around, do the cooking. She, of course, wouldn't have ever done the uh, cleaning. She didn't know how to drive, and she definitely didn't know how to cook. And one uh, evening, she, the cook, who she employed, of course, made a wonderful meal, piroshki, let's uh, imagine. And Mrs. Zyganik, or Professor Zyganik, was really very pleased. She thought that the cook had done fabulously. And so the next morning, she said to the cook, that was really fabulous. What was the recipe? And as the cook started describing what she did, Mrs. Iganik thought about something else because she wasn't in the slightest interested, but she just wanted to appear nice. The cook explained what you did, and then halfway through, she thought, what's going on here? Professor Zyganik doesn't know how to cook. Why does she want to know this recipe? Because she was asking how it was all done. Why does she want it? The only reason can be that she wants to fire me. So halfway through the description, she stopped. She said, that's all I'm going to tell you. And Professor Zyganik said, now this is in my words. I don't know exactly what she said. I wasn't around in 1910, whatever some of you think. Um, uh, Professor Zyganik said, no, 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 go, go on. I would like uh, to know. No, no, I'm not to tell you. No, 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 go on. And then Professor Zyganik said, damn this. This cook's not going to say anything. I could spend a lot of time, but what will be much more interesting, I'm going to work and I'm going to write a paper called the Zyganik effect, which will become very famous. And what it means is when you have partial information, you very much want the rest. Even though you're not interested in the partial information, you want the rest. And that's called the Zyganik effect. And advertisers uh, use it. Uh, that's where we have uh, serials. Politicians know all about the Zyganik effect, maybe without knowing where it comes from. But they tell you something which you're not particularly interested in. And then they know how to slide it around to make you fascinated. Next time I'm invited to give a talk, I'm going to explain the theory of what's on. So I want you to be very interested <laughs> next time in inviting me and hearing about the theory. But I'll give you some take-home messages uh, now. There have been some new experiments on the flow of granular material. There's a power law for the intermediate spreading, and we know how to evaluate alpha and beta from the experiments, that the scaling exponent, the final thickness, the uh, run-out uh, distance. And that's my uh, take-home message, but far more important than that. I think we're very grateful to Ishan and Thank you. Now, Ishan can explain what the, <laughs> the Hindi underneath. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, of course, of course. Uh, Herbert, how, how does this differ, uh, the granular material, from, say, a lighter liquid that would spread on top? Oh, uh, good question, and I should have said that. If I would released a lighter liquid, it would have gone on forever. It wouldn't have uh, stopped. I don't totally understand why it stops. And you see here, over time, oh, it went this way, didn't it? It has still uh, stopped. The Reynolds number is large, except very, very near the end. It may well be that surface tension is playing a uh, role. I've already started uh, doing some work on the theory of this. I don't want to tell you too much, because otherwise you won't be interested in the future, uh, with John Hench. Um, but it is definitely different to, particle driven flows are definitely different to fluid flows. With respect to Joe's question, isn't there something analogous to an angle of repose for these inverted gravitational piles? I don't think so. Um, I'll have to. Now that would say, I don't think so because the um, typical, uh, well let, let's go really back to, uh, oh, no maybe that was a better one to say. Um, this, uh, oh yeah, that's not at the end. Well no, but you can already see here, this is getting close-ish to the end and it doesn't change uh, much. This still grows a lot, but the angle here is pretty much zilch. Uh, the angle here is whatever and it's much uh, less here. I mean, when you allow grains to flow out, they all go with the angle of repose and I've of course looked at that. Um, but uh, this I don't think is like that at all. It's true that here, there's, at this point in time, there's a pretty straight uh, line, um, but not there. So I don't think the angle of repose is the correct thing. What's this? <laughs> it's the rest of your song. <laughs> Don't know where that came from, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a couple more questions over here. Yeah, sure. so, uh, in, in some of the slides you showed that when you do a proper non-dimensionalization, then it is fitting on some kind of a universal curve. But when both the axes are length scales and you are non-dimensionalizing by the same length scale, uh -huh. then I don't see how the scatter comes down. Be, because the length scale depends on the parameters of each experiment. So the scatter comes down because <laughs> it depends on how uh, uh, wide the uh, lock is and how, what the mass is of uh, the particles. So each experiment has its own non-dimensionalization number, if you like. But the x-axis and the y-axis both are getting non-dimensionalized by the same no, they're all non-dimensionalized appropriate to the experiment. So the non, that means the non-dimensionalization is uh, different. So if I, for example, said the time taken to fall here and the time taken to fall here, uh, I'd find that I'd get quite different graphs. This would go quite differently to that one here. Uh, but if I non-dimensionalized it, knowing S equals a half GT squared, then I could make it exactly the same. I could put one point on top of the other. Uh, sir, uh, in the first two, three videos that you have shown, the examples of particles suspended and flowing along with the fluid. So considering that this experiment is, in a, is a uh, resemblance of the, those situations, why did you consider the particle density to be such that it is floating on the surface and you are considering the movement of the friend uh, at, the surf at the interface? I mean, if you consider the density to be higher than, I mean, if it is just uh, completely immersed, do the exponent remain same? Like, do, do the power law holds, I mean, does the power law hold? I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand much uh, of that. No. Can you ask it in a short sentence that I can understand? Uh, I mean, why should the particles 
that you considered are like susp- I mean like floating yeah. but if you if the particles are instead submerged because the actual situation is uh, where the particles are everywhere right it is not like they are at the I, I'm very embarrassed but would somebody translate yeah oh The reason I'm asking is like in the first two, three videos, he has actually shown where particles are actually suspended and they are flowing along with the fluid and the particles are everywhere. So, uh, I mean, uh, if you change the density, the power law, does it hold for the same exponent? Oh. I guess in the, the original experiments, the particles are everywhere in the fluid that's Everywhere? In the pyroclastic flows. Oh. No. No, I think it in the I, I'm not sure that I still understood your question. I'm sorry, but in the pyroclastic flow there's a huge variation in uh, both density and size of particles because you can have very little ones and you can have big ones and you can have different porosities in uh, them and what we know is that they go out on the surface of the ocean and they sink at different rates. They last for a while and it's surface tension that brings the water up in them and then eventually because of the combination of the water that they soak up and the rock in which is of course heavier than water they uh, sink but that uh, takes a uh, while. What I could say and I should have said was of course, uh, I did uh, three, if you like, simple experiments. One to show you a compositional current, the second one to show you a heavy uh, particle current, and the third to show you a light particle current. But you could mix them up. You can have a compositional particle laden uh, flow where uh, the particles will uh, eventually fall to the bottom, and instead of making a coignium bright flow, uh, it could uh, keep on going if we uh, did this in the tank, and you could have light particles and heavy in uh, heavy uh, fluid. So they, yeah, there's no doubt, lots of combinations. Okay, so I think with that, let's uh, thank the speaker and all speakers of this morning and afternoon session. Thank you.